Hey y'all, Scott here, and welcome, 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 marketing rats. This is Marketing 101, the 101st edition of our marketing tutorials. Today I'm going to show you how to successfully market that Nintendo GameCube game that you're selling in 2018 marketed. Thanks for learning the ins and outs of marketing with me today. If you choose to purchase our next video release, I'll show you how to put a down payment on a house with just your signature on this piece of paper. Yeah, I was in the video and even following the directions. I don't know why, I came out with bread. Mankind has achieved a multitude of amazing things, putting a man on the moon, the great pyramids, the continuous evolution of the sciences, but for some reason they made player's choice f***ing yellow, so might as well start over. Listen man, I do dig a hearty video game from time to time, and a good portion of that dig ratio is definitely playing said hearty video game. But once you're done playing it and put it back on the shelf, that's how it'll look for the majority of your life, sitting there mainly serving as a conversation piece or incredibly expensive decor until you decide to pop it back in again. So I usually really do care on how the spine of a video game looks. I mean, I never won't buy a game because the spine is screech inducing, but whenever I pick up a new title, the spine is one of the first things to look at because, well, that's how it'll look like when it's on my shelf. And let me tell you, I can't get enough of that darn consistency. If a video game library's boxes all line up with each other, <laughs> oh boy, there's truly no other feeling like it. I know, I've talked scoliosis enough in the past, I'll make this little spine tangent as brief as I can possibly make a spine tangent. Take the PS4 games for example, they all have the same PS4 headers followed by a custom spine featuring the game logo and art. The fact that they all have their own custom art and logos with the same PS4 header, wow. Similar situation with the Wii, most game boxes are all white with the custom game logos. They just look really nice all together. Yeah, some games have custom colored boxes like New Super Mario Bros. Wii's red one and Mario and Sonic at the London 2012 Olympic Games' yellow one, and while I would have preferred these boxes to be white like the rest, I can live with these, they're so infrequent that they mainly feel like special games. The pics of the litter, cool things to make them stand out from the rest. Now if 20% of the Wii library had a red case, that's when it would get a little on the too far side of things. When a good chunk of a game console's library has one specific design compared to the rest, the world's flippin' pissometers all collectively burst. The first half of the PS3's life had spines like these, and then they decided to switch the logo to something completely different. I do prefer the second logo, but man, if you alphabetize your games like I do, you just buy yourself a ticket to Inc consistency jungle, an interaction that's borderline irritating. The Wii U's spines, however, were deservingly absent from the nominations at the Spineys years 2012 through 2017. They obviously tried to make them all consistent, but all it did was irk. They continually kept on flip-flopping between stock generic fonts and actual game logos. Like, why does Mario Tennis Ultra Smash, Star Fox Zero, and Game & Wario have their own logos, but then Splatoon, Captain Toad, Treasure Tracker, and New Super Mario Bros. U have this generic font? Then they allowed Capcom and Square Enix to make one game each with a black spine for some reason, and then they made Star Fox Guards box have this eggnog stain of a color. Nintendo even forgot to add the blue ridge on the top of the Wii Sports Club box. I do prefer having colorful spines that feature art from the game and the game's logo, but if a game console library spines are one way, game publishers, please follow in everybody else's footsteps. The Nintendo Switch library sees the majority of games use the same font on a red background, and while that doesn't leave a lot of room for creativity, eh, it looks nice on a shelf. Except we have troublemakers in the form of Super Bomberman R. God, what? is this? Not only is the title centered instead of left aligned like every other Switch game, but why is Konami's logo like this? Why? Overall, I like some consistency in my game boxes. Is it OCD? Well, as somebody who unknowingly has OCD would say, I don't know. So please, take this into consideration when I paint this picture in your head. Popular must-have games, reprinted for low, low prices. I don't know about you, but I had myself at so please take this into consideration, but there's a catch. <laughs> This thing looks miserable. This isn't a game, it's what people hold up in mugshots. Player's Choice, Greatest Hits, Platinum Hits, Nintendo Select, Sega All-Stars, they go by many names but serve one purpose, to muck up anybody's up-and-coming game collection and turn them into something foul. That's a nice looking GameCube library you have there, holy shit, I made a huge mistake making that observation. The concept of these re-releases is great, being hit games at a price where they're practically giving them away. But they all mess it up hard by ruining the packaging with different colors, graphics, designs, whatever. They stick out like a sore thumb. Since these were re-releases, these are the most current prints of these games, meaning a lot of the time, they're everywhere. They're the easiest to find. And every single major game company had their own line of these re-releases, and they all made sure they were eyesores for some reason. And the terminal illness started with Sega Classics on the Sega Genesis. Sega Classics aren't super awful, mainly because the Genesis games themselves don't follow a strict format. While many have the black grid or the red design, many don't at all and have their own custom one. It always felt weird to me that you were supposed to keep the Genesis cases due to their hard plastic, yet there was so much variation in the box art layout. While the SNES boxes were all incredibly unified in terms of design, yet 
Nintendo didn't expect you to put them on a shelf and keep them, they were just cardboard boxes, they were born to be thrown away. Speaking of which, the Super Nintendo and Game Boy were the first appearances of the term player's choice. Making amazing games like Super Mario All-Stars, A Link to the Past, and Super Metroid a measly 20 bucks is awesome. And the way they went about these re-releases on the SNES was tolerable in my opinion. The cartridges now have a player's choice ribbon graphic on them, and the line on the label changed from red to golden. Not a big issue in my opinion, I mean A Link to the Past re-release is uproariously apparent you have the re-release, but the majority of player's choice on SNES ain't that bad. The same goes for N64, Nintendo did a very similar thing with these re-releases, just popping a ribbon graphic on them. If I I could choose, I would definitely pick up the original copies, but in my opinion, if you have the player's choice copies of SNES and N64 games, I won't completely disregard you. Now Game Boy is where we start to get f**ky. God, these boxes look tart. Literally, they couldn't just stop at a ribbon graphic. They had to change the entire Game Boy logo. Thankfully, the cartridge itself only has the ribbon on it, but was this really necessary? However, Nintendo decided that wasn't enough and decided to go full-on sociopath with player's choice on GameCube. This is horrendous, replacing the black labels with yellow ones. The front box art and spine are affected here, it could have been worse. But come on, they could have chosen any other color, they chose yellow. The only thing I can think of for the reasoning behind the hard color change is that Nintendo believed that consumers would be attracted to the yellow, as it would yell to them saying, hey, I'm a best-selling game at a crazy low price. The thing is, I don't think any consumer knew why these games were yellow, and I think if anybody had an option, they'd go with the black GameCube games because that fits snugly with the rest of their collection. Also, from what I've heard, games can't yell. It's like Nintendo has a mentality. When a consumer sees a player's choice title, they know they're in for gallons of joy at a price to die for. No! Nobody thinks that! Just the fact that these games are at a low price should be enough to grab a consumer's attention. Why'd they have to smear yellow all over the place? And at that point, why not just add a graphic to the front cover and call it a day? Why the spine, which nobody would see in most retailers, why does it have to be obliterated in this process? The Game Boy Advance had the right idea. It had the same player's choice graphic, but it was only on the front cover and nowhere else, not on the spine of the box. And even then, most people threw the GBA boxes away, so with these things, I would have been more than okay with the disease spreading to the spine. But nope, they had to put it on their home console with cases people actually kept. Even though I hate the yellow player's choice label with a passion, I'm still stuck wondering who got it worse, the US or Europe? Huh. Nintendo moved on from player's choice and now refers to their budget gaming line as Nintendo Select, starting with the Wii and continuing on with the 3DS and Wii U. These? I'm way more into. The spines only have a small medallion on the bottom, and that's cool with me. It's not jarring, and many games have a graphic on the bottom like this anyway, so it doesn't stick out hard hard. I mean, if I have the option, I'd definitely trade these out for the original prints, but I don't have a problem sleeping at night with these games in my collection. Japan never got Nintendo Selects or even Player's Choice, instead they have the Happy Price Selection for the 3DS, which, hey, if you want to feel like you're buying a puppet show instead of a game, the Happy Price Selection has you covered. The Nintendo DS never had a Nintendo Managed Budget Software lineup, but that didn't stop Konami from re-releasing their own games under their own ulcer of a packaging. This is the kind of box art that raises more questions than answers. The disease spreads further. Sony is just as guilty with these types of packaging. PlayStation uses the moniker Greatest Hits, and the PS1 had this ooze onto the front cover. Honestly, this isn't my least favorite in the world. It's not good by any means, but it looks far nicer than what the PS2 got. Jesus, man, who in the right mind said, Burgundy? How is this color appealing to anybody below the age of 80? And why is the header now curved? PS3, we have red. Better than the PS2, but still not the greatest in the world, because now the case is red too. Speaking of red, Sega had one more crack at the re-releases with the Dreamcast in the form of Sega All-Stars, which are basically less annoying forms of the PS1's greatest hits. But we still have this monstrosity to go over, Xbox's Platinum Hits. Microsoft made sure you damn well knew you had a Platinum Hits copy of a game, as the entirety of the box is coded in this thing. The header, the box art itself has a border, the spine, including where the game logo is, it's just cream to bits. I mean, at least it's silver, which is a pretty conservative and nice looking color. It does clash with the others, but at least it's not yellow compared to black or burgundy compared to black. I don't know, I don't like these at all, but I still have a burning or hatred for player's choice and greatest hits from that generation. But don't worry everybody, Microsoft redeemed themselves in terms of not pissing me off enough because let's talk about the Xbox 360 generation where they had so many different designs for Platinum Hits games, it's hard to keep track of. The first design was this, basically a border around the box art and the spine where the game's logo was changed to be this gray thing. Honestly, 
not that bad. It doesn't really stick out that much in comparison to other games. Then they change it to this, where Platinum Hit spreads to the header and enlarges the spine's header as well. This one is gross. I hate the fact that the 360 header on the spine is way longer than it needs to be. After this, there were a few Platinum Hits that just had a simple logo on the front cover with nothing else, and my god, this is how you do it. Just a little graphic on the front is fine, it's perfect. After these non-complaints, Microsoft went back to the drawing board and came back with this. Ah, uh, what is this? So the header is the same elongated one from before, but now with a gradient from gray to white. I never liked how the text was in white, so it got harder and harder to read against the gradient. But, why? Why is the spine white with the most stock generic font imaginable? There's no reason for this. Why does it look this way? Recently, Microsoft has re-released Xbox 360 games that are backwards compatible with the Xbox One in this new packaging that looks like the Xbox One boxes, but absolutely not at the same time. I hate these too. Like, why not put a graphic on the original releases that just says playable on Xbox One? Instead, you have it clash with the rest of your Xbox library, no matter what console you have. Have an Xbox 360? Doesn't look right next to the rest of the games. Xbox One? Same thing, because it's a standard standard DVD case compared to the Blu-ray size cases of the Xbox One. There is no reason why these re-releases should stick out this badly. And you know what's even worse? Some games were exclusively released in this packaging. Pikmin 2's Wii release took a while to get here in North America, and when it did, Nintendo slapped the Nintendo Selects border on it. Why? This game was never released in North America, how can it already be a Nintendo Select? Some people go for complete sets of these re-releases, and you know, that must be a fun thing to collect. Good on those people. But for everybody else, if you just wanted to play Super Mario Sunshine and have the player's choice copy, it looks janker than jank next to the rest of your games, and it doesn't need to be. They didn't have to change the look of the spines, they didn't have to change the color of the cases, they could have just popped a graphic on the front that said best seller, lower the MSRP, and call it a day. But the fact that they went the extra mile deserves a solid shake of the fist. And thus, it was torn, it being that, because that tears it. I'm gonna form a strongly worded verbal letter to Nintendo about these roadkills of re-releases. Hey, Nintendo, why do you have to make player's choice so lame? Well, sir, it was the player's choice. Oh, God. We did this. Hey all, Scott here. It's 40 odd 90 and kids these days have it so easy. They only have to walk 20 miles in the snow to go to school. Oh yeah, well I had to battle leprosy. My favorite food is no indoor plumbing. It's pretty tough living in this time period, so hopefully in the future they'll have bathrooms and flying cars and Mario Power Tennis with motion controls. The Nintendo GameCube is my favorite game console of all time. No other system, in my opinion, had the quality and quantity of the types of games I like. The games were just different back then. So many franchises were being nurtured and supported, the games looked and played beautifully. Even licensed games had a certain level of quality you just don't see in those types of titles these days. It was such an exciting era, and going back to it, most of it holds up tremendously. But I can't fit the controller in my mouth. Thankfully, Nintendo listened, and their next console, the Wii... Well, now they gotta re-release Pikmin. Listen, I'm not one to encourage popularity contests, but let's be honest here. The Wii sold over 100 million units. The GameCube, you wouldn't be caught dead f***ing a GameCube. So, off to the drawing board. Nintendo created the Wii, which went for an entirely new market. Everybody who didn't own a GameCube. Motion controls with the Wii Remote and Nunchuck. They really did change a man. I'm running for Senator. This system blew up because of the controllers, but in reality, the Wii was more or less a souped up GameCube power-wise. I mean, Nintendo wanted another shot at this hardware. If your son only sells 21 million units, that's embarrassing. Using last generation technology kept costs down and gave the Wii an affordable price point. Couple that with the fancy controllers, Go f*** yourself. And working with older hardware makes game development easier. Nintendo's developers didn't have to relearn much to continue making games for the Wii. They struggled with game output on the Nintendo 64 because of the transition to fully 3D games. The same happened with HD game development on Wii U. But see, with the Wii, they could just take games that they were making for the GameCube and transition them over to the console no problem. They barely even had to upgrade the graphics. It was the Wii. People knew it was basically another GameCube. Why mask it? The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess was initially a GameCube exclusive, but they thought, these two platforms are basically the same thing, and if we put it out on Wii, it can be a launch title. Oops! Super Paper Mario was originally being developed as a GameCube game, but they decided to just make it a Wii game. Capcom put Resident Evil 4 on the Wii early on. If Masahiro Sakurai didn't return as director for a Wii version of Super Smash Bros., they were just going to re-release Super Smash Bros. Melee on the Wii with online support. The fact these two systems were so similar power-wise made things efficient for Nintendo and other developers. They could take GameCube projects that either already released or were in development and put them on Wii with no major pressure on upgrading the visuals. So the main focus of these re-releases 
was the controls. Nintendo loves re-releases. They would re-release Jesus Christ if they could. But see, you couldn't just re-release all of your GameCube games on the Wii because we could already play GameCube discs. If you were gonna re-release a game, you had to re-release it for a good reason. And out of lust doesn't count. Nintendo's solution, the new play control line. Nintendo, that's your solution to everything. Budget ports of GameCube games with enhancements enabled by the power of Wii. These weren't like, oh, Mario Power Tennis Definitive Edition. They were more like, here's the original game, but on Wii, including the benefits that come with being on Wii. These are by and large the exact same games, but with some tweaks here and there, making most of these the best way to play. Most. In 2008, Nintendo announced plans for a new line of Wii software under the brand Wii De Asobu Selection. That roughly translates to Play on Wii. Why didn't everything have that label? GameCube games updated for the system even though you could already play them on Wii. Pikmin 1 and Donkey Kong Jungle Beat were the first two games announced, and most people were... Ah, ah fucking befuddled. You could already play these games on your Wii. What's the point of this? If backwards compatibility wasn't an option, sure. I can see why they do this, but it was. Looking back on comments, people just didn't get it. Like stimulus checks. However, in hindsight, this line made a lot more sense than initially thought. First off, GameCube games on Wii still required GameCube accessories, like controllers, memory cards, so acting like all Wii owners had the right to Pikmin wasn't true. Sure, they could play the game on their Wii, but they sort of had to go out of their way to do it. Not only did they have to own all this junk, they had to track down a copy of the original game. Also, I think 99% of Wii owners didn't know what a GameCube was. Hey, Grandma Mario Power Tennis is already on Wii! You just have to get a GameCube controller and memory card in the original game, which isn't in print anymore, and you can only find used copies of it in some GameStop stores and on eBay? Oh, f she said I'm in. All right, but not everybody wanted to deal with that, so adapting these games to the Wii console, it makes a lot more sense nowadays. Soon, the games were announced to come to Europe with no further details, and later on afterwards, the games were fully confirmed worldwide to be under the brand New Play Control. You know a name is good when you can swap around the three words in it, and it makes just as much sense as the official one. So when Nintendo introduces a new branding, how long are they in for? They get bored easily. Come on, seven games? And only three of them had the new Play Control branding in North America? Nintendo was the best at this. Hey, buy the Wii U microphone. It's compatible with a statistic. Well, the few new Play Control titles we did get, we got starting on March 9th, 2009 over here with Europe starting things out in February and Japan kicking it all off in December of 2008. And for roughly the next year, the rest of the titles were trickled out. This line didn't really go anywhere after 2009, which just makes its introduction even stranger. Either they only had a few games in mind for it, which at that point, why even create a unifying brand just called New Play Control Pikmin Pikmin Resurrected or something? Or they were unhappy with the sales of the existing New Play Control stuff and cancel future plans for the line. Maybe sales weren't that great because these boxes look like they were as seen on TV. This is how they appeared in stores with so many random text blurbs and generic Wii circle designs all over the place. Even the spine feels the need to say New Play Control twice. I think even Nintendo knew this design wasn't ideal. It doesn't feel like box art, it feels like an advertisement. They gave each of these games a reversible cover with the original box art taking up the full space. It's still labeled as new play control though, but I think I just realized the font they use for this is the same font a lot of Nintendo's first party GameCube games used on their spines. You win this time, Nintendo. I do kind of like that, but by and large, these are full-fledged Wii releases. Thick manuals, full disc art, these are just as Wii as any fling smash on the street. They just happen to make the boxes as unappealing as possible. I'm sorry for dogging on this, but like I said, these are full Wii games, yet the boxes make them feel like so much less than that. 100%, these did not make sales expectations. Just Looking at this little ad included in Mario Power Tennis, it states, Keep an eye out for these and more titles in the series. These were the only new Play Control titles. Japan did get all the games that were part of the line, and they all look very similar to how they did in other regions. So with the reversible covers, they do put unique little warts on the spine of each game. You know, I should talk about the asphalt I drove on to buy these games. Enough stalling. Let's see what GameCube games look like on my Wii. Well, let's go in North American release order. First up, New Play Control Pikmin released on March 9th, 2009. So Pikmin on the Nintendo GameCube, a game that came out so close to the GameCube's launch, it didn't. It may not have lit the world on fire sales-wise, but it did decent enough, selling over 1 million copies of a new IP on a system that sold only 21 million units. I think that's pretty good. Of course, being an early GameCube game comes with the quirks of looking fucking disgusting. It looks fine, albeit pretty dated. But what does Nintendo do to an eight-year-old game with dated visuals? Let me see more of them. The first addition to a new play control game, widescreen support. Now, Pikmin on the GameCube control perfectly fine. I never really had any complaints with it. You aim your Pikmin with the analog stick. You are restricted to where you're facing, though. I think an immediate idea people would have would be left stick controls character, right stick controls cursor. No, it's, it's not like that. We as humans have to accept this is how to Pikmin. 
until now. Now, not only do you point the screen at wherever you want your Pikmin to be thrown exactly, but you can move independently of this cursor. This is a huge deal for Pikmin. Again, the GameCube controls work perfectly. There's really not much wrong with them. Sure, they could have given you the option to use the C-Stick to aim, but this is 2001 Nintendo. I don't think they knew the stick existed. But for what it is, Pikmin on GameCube controls just fine. However, you compare it to the Wii version and it's night and day. Whenever I go back to this one, I just think, God, I, mean, I just want to lock onto this fucker. On the Wii, it's seamless. You don't think about it. This works, but the Wii Remote and Nunchuck were made for Pikmin. Some sound effects come through the Wii Remote now, which is cute. Though any sound that comes through this speaker makes me feel like I'm drowning, and vice versa. Holy sh I thought it was playing Mario. There are various other small tweaks made to things graphically, sound, and gameplay-wise. Nothing massive, just little improvements like Pikmin survive a tad longer if they're drowning or on fire. And that stinks because I f***ing love drowning Pikmin. Guess who's pissed? Other than that, the only thing that may be a slight downgrade from the original would potentially be the fact that, man, when you want to throw Pikmin onto something, you mash the A button across both versions. On the GameCube, you can stay locked onto one thing by... Well, just not moving the analog stick. On the Wii, if you mash the A button to throw your Pikmin, it's more likely your cursor's gonna fidget a lot considering it's kinda hard to keep your hand perfectly still while having an aneurysm. But I've never really come across a moment where that's detrimental. I just think some people may not like that compared to the original. But this is the definitive version of Pikmin in my opinion, and unlike other re-releases that change quite a bit, this is literally the exact same game as the GameCube one. Any tweaks are pretty minor and they are for the better. So we're off to a good start with New Play Control. This was completely warranted. So what happened the same day as New Play Control, Pikmin? It wasn't the best day for multiple reasons. New Play Control Mario Power Tennis released the same day as Pikmin on the Wii, but released on the GameCube in 2004. It was pretty good, but I wouldn't say it was my top choice for a game to get a second chance on Wii. They brought Pikmin over because it felt like that game would legitimately benefit from being played with a Wii remote. They brought Mario Power Tennis over as a replacement for a Mario Tennis made specifically for Wii. Yeah, for some reason, Nintendo skipped out on Mario Golf and tennis games during this generation. The developers of those series, Camelot, seemed to at the very least want to do a Mario Golf game. They made their own game with Capcom. But instead of getting to make a new Mario sports game for Wii, they just ported Power Tennis from the GameCube. Well, of course, we have widescreen now, which also applies to the cutscenes, too. But when it comes to video files, it's absolutely terrifying they just zoom into a 4x3 image or stretch it across the screen, but no. Either this cutscene was always made with widescreen in mind, or they went in and re-exported it to widescreen. This is fantastic! You see so much more in the frame than ever before, even though it's the exact same video from the GameCube! Alright, we got the widescreen checked off, the controls... Oh, It's fine. It's okay. It's just so much worse than the original on GameCube, so it just makes me ask, why even do this? They oversimplified Mario Tennis. Mario Tennis, the game I already pretty much just hit the A button in. When you played tennis in Wii Sports, sure, it's basic, but it was made for motion control. In Mario Power Tennis, it's basically them taking button commands from the GameCube and assigning Wii Remote shakes to it. It's patronizing. It's not better on Wii. It's literally just for if you want the illusion that you're swinging a tennis racket and for that illusion to barely work. It's just not as well controlled here. The motion controls feel half-baked in. Like, it works, it's fine, but it just isn't as precise as the original. I like motion controls, but the game has to be properly designed around them. This was originally a GameCube game that was ported over to Wii that just replaces hitting the A button with shaking the Wii remote. Boo. Also, why is there no online play? It feels like this would have been the perfect opportunity to include online multiplayer in Mario Tennis for the first time, but just as I predicted, while this is a solid enough port technically, it was done just to put a Mario Tennis on Wii and nothing else. Again, it's fine. It's not that bad of a version. It's just like, why? Well, we had to wait a whole two months for another new Play Control game, this one being Donkey Kong Jungle Beat, released on May 4th, 2009. Jungle Beat originally used the DK Bongos. You know what else used the DK Bongos? Probably not Geist. Such an interesting peripheral. Bongos that were themed exclusively to Donkey Kong that got more than one game. Not only did it get multiple rhythm games called Donkey Konga, Nintendo crafted a full Donkey Kong platformer based around them. You smack, clap, really do anything to get evicted. This is such a wonderfully stupid idea to play a platformer with bongos, but it works. The problem though, for how wild this concept is, it definitely turned off some people and makes the game a much harder sell, even if you could still play the game with a regular GameCube controller. But that's no fun, so this Wii version is kind of the best of both worlds. You get a more traditional control setup with buttons and sticks, but you still get to perform actions similar to what you do with the bongos. The result is a much more refined and accessible version of Jungle Beat that does unfortunately lose a hint of magic. This control scheme works quite well, but 
Damn it, the other one used bongos. That was what made Jungle Beat so interesting. It's still a good game, but it's like playing Wii Sports with an Xbox controller. This did make me think how nice it would have been if these versions supported the GameCube Classic controller. It truly would have made all of the new play control titles by default the definitive releases, no questions asked. You get the best of both worlds. You can play the original way with any of the enhancements the Wii versions bring with it, or you can just not be a bitch and play with a Wii remote. It would have been nice to have Bongo or GameCube controller support, but that's just not how new play control rolls. Jungle Beat's also interesting because it's the only new play control title to actually add new content to the game. There's a few new levels in this version. Nothing crazy, basically a boss rush and one final celebratory level for collecting everything. But just goes to show, this is the most changed game of the lineup. The bosses of various levels were swapped around from the original version, how levels are organized, some levels had to be redesigned for the new controls, even the story was expanded. It's still not massive, but in comparison to the GameCube version, which had a single sentence explaining things, it's definitely slightly different. Jungle Beat on the GameCube story was, I don't know who Donkey Kong is, but he's pissed. It's still Jungle Beat at the end of the day, though there were definitely some more changes than other new play control titles. I wouldn't not recommend this version, but you are missing out on a bit of the fun by playing without the bongos. That's it. There were more new play control games, but only these three titles carry the name in North America. Like, you don't name Jaundice if only three people get it. Metroid Prime and Metroid Prime 2 Echoes were two other games a part of the new Play Control line, only in Japan, though. Over here, they were bundled alongside Metroid Prime 3 Corruption for Metroid Prime Trilogy, releasing on August 24th, 2009. And you know what? I'll gladly take getting three games for $50 in comparison to buying one of each for 30 I don't know why they felt the need to give us a massive deal like this. I mean, it's Nintendo. They charge extra for when they put less effort in. But I'll take it, and I'll extra take the lack of new Play Control branding. No, I don't need Play Classic GameCube games with enhanced Wii Control on my cover. Shocking, I know. If I had to guess, I assume Nintendo already figured this brand had somewhat negative effects on sales. I guess uh, this doesn't look very appealing and the name doesn't make me go, here. So packaging the first two games with one already released on Wii was a smart move. But that doesn't mean the Japanese new play controller version of Metroid Prime is the exact same as the Metroid Prime trilogy version of Metroid Prime. Like the channel intro video. Ooh. The title screen. In Metroid Prime Trilogy, you just select one of the games from the menu and it hops right in. The Japanese version... Yeah. Metroid Prime on the GameCube was a revolution for the Metroid series, bringing it not only into 3D for the first time, but in a first-person perspective. This completely had every opportunity to blow, but it didn't. This game is remarkable and still holds up to this day. Control's weird, though. Much like Pikmin, this works perfectly fine. Move with the analog stick, then to aim your arm cannon, and use the C-stick. Gotcha. You hold down the shoulder button, and you stay in place as you aim. Huh, I mean it works, the Metroid Prime is designed around this control scheme, it does the job. But when we move over to the Wii versions, oh this is so much better. It's similar to how Pikmin was upgraded, now we can move and aim independently of one another, and at the same time too. It makes the game so much more intuitive, so much faster paced, this is no doubt better than the GameCube original. Not that this version controlled poorly, but this is just so much better. But there are some things that are worse on Wii though, even though the game overall looks better with widescreen support and more advanced textures, apparently they took out some small special effects like water rippling. Can't forget Metroid Prime 2 Echoes because if I do, everybody else will. I always found this to be one of the lesser talked about Metroid games, so I will continue this tradition. Take all of what I said to Metroid Prime on Wii and apply it to the sequel. Echoes on the GameCube had the same control scheme, so it also deserved the Wii upgrade. It was all included in Metroid Prime Trilogy, except for the channel intro and title screen. Ooh, uh. And that is the new Play Control series. What the f is that? Much like how Prime's follow up got a new Play Control release, Pikmin's sequel got one as well. New Play Control Pikmin 2 released on March 12th, 2009 in Japan, April 24th, 2009 in Europe, and June 10th, 2012 in North America. What was the diagnosis? A yeah, new Play Control Pikmin 2 just didn't come out here for three years. I assume it's because Pikmin 1 really didn't sell well on Wii. I'm telling you, they knew this brand wasn't great. Now why did they finally decide to release Pikmin 2 in North America? 
Probably because they were bored. 2012 was the year the Wii's successor was hitting the market, and the final year of any Nintendo console is generally pathetic. It was the year of Mario Party 9 and very little else. Because of this, Nintendo of America decided to publish some games that hadn't made it over here yet, like Xenoblade Chronicles and, of course, Pikmin 2. They released it as a Nintendo Selects game, which not only meant it retailed for $20 at launch, but also that we weren't lacking some stupid f***ing border. They include some text which states this is a GameCube game with Wii controls, but nowhere does it say new play control, not anywhere on the box, the disc, the other games had it, but this one, it is a new play control Pikmin 2 over here, it's just Pikmin 2. Mario Power Tennis got a Nintendo Selects version, and they removed the new Play Control title from that one, too. See, I'm telling you, this brand was a nightmare. I always find it weird when they release a game for the first time through these budget things. Like, Nintendo Selects is supposed to mean this game sold over a million copies, or it was a smash hit already, so they're re-releasing it at a budget price. But that's just not true here. Nintendo, just admit you were scared to give Ohioans Pikmin 2. While well, playing the game, is Pikmin 2 on Wii. This is my favorite way to play Pikmin 2, retaining most of the same changes and enhancements Pikmin 1 saw on the platform. I'm happy it finally came over here after so long, which is more than I can say about Chibi Robo. So we finally got Pikmin 2, good for us, but there was still one more new play control title that never left Japan. Surprised? The final new play control title, Chibi Robo, released on June 11th, 2009, in Japan only. So this was a GameCube game released the year the Wii came out, and it had a funny, stupid name. They were asking for this. So it makes sense to give Chibi Robo a second chance on Wii. You just don't want to give him too much of a second chance. The only new play control title to not leave Japan in any form. Definitely a shame, as this could have slightly given Chibi Robo more of a shot here in the States. I mean, it wouldn't have done that well, considering other new play control titles sort of flopped, but the translation work was already done for the GameCube version, so it would have been pretty fairly easy to localize this one. Nintendo already barely advertised new play control in North America, America, so it's not like a ton of marketing budget would be blown on this game. And it just straight up would have filled out Nintendo's 2009 release schedule a bit more. There's a good reason why new play control was a thing that year. But, no. JB Rebel for Wii stayed in Japan, and after playing this version, I can kind of see why. The motion controls really don't add anything to this game. You just shake your remote to clean spots up, use the pointer to select yes or no options, which is honestly kind of annoying. In the original game, you would just use the analog stick. Here, you still use the analog stick to move, but then they force you to point the Wii remote at the screen to say yes or no. The controls work fine, but I wouldn't call them better. It is kind of cool that they incorporate some point-and-click elements in this version, as Chibi Robo originally was envisioned as a point-and-click adventure game. But this is definitely in the lower tier of new play control, in my opinion. Both Metroid Prime and Pikmin games are better on Wii. Donkey Kong Jungle Beat is debatable. Then Mario Power Tennis and Chibi Robo. They're fine versions with some good enhancements, but overall, I do think the GameCube originals are the way to go. New Play Control is such an odd subset of the Wii library to me. What once was something I saw no value in became something I'm surprised I didn't do more of. Just get rid of the branding New Play Control and re-release more games like this. Pikmin and Metroid Prime showed the potential this line had. I think Luigi's Mansion would have been perfect for New Play Control. Even Mario Sunshine being able to point your flashlight and flood pack with the Wii remote would work crazy well. Mario Golf Toadstool Tour. If they thought Mario Power Tennis deserved it, just do it. Throw Mario golf on there. What about Wind Waker? Give it the Twilight Princess treatment and use the Wii Remote as a sword? It especially would have made sense with the Wind Waker in the game, using the remote as a conductor's baton. What about Star Fox Assault, F-Zero GX, Kirby Air Ride? It just used the Wii Remote like a steering wheel. This had so much potential. But they gave up before New Play Control really had a chance to make the Wii this ultimate Nintendo console. Sure, it didn't have a Star Fox, but with New Play Control, it kinda could have. These titles retailed for $29.99 and obviously took less time to develop than brand new games. So it just kind of puzzles me why Nintendo doesn't do more of this. On the Wii U, they put out Wind Waker HD and Twilight Princess HD, and if they did more re-releases like that, it would fill up any software droughts and bring back a classic while enhancing it at the same time. And that's what New Play Control did, but they gave up on it after 2009. Where was Mario Golf? Not every entry here is the definitive version, but they're cool versions of GameCube games from another dimension. In honor of them, I've decided to turn a new leaf, and yes, I do need this blurb. If I need to hide this thing, I can. I never use the lower 60% of my body anyways. Hey all, Scott here. This is getting old. I may have finally stopped getting robbed two weeks ago, but I just started getting robbed three weeks ago. Okay, this is getting ridiculous. I'm gonna make some calls and get to the bottom of this. A bank? The bank? A bank. Yeah, I was wondering if I could take out a loan to assign a hit. Uh, let me check. Are you sure your name isn't you?
No. Yeah, we repossessed most of your belongings. We are a bank after all. Oh, thank God. I wasn't robbed. Eh. So can I take it alone to repossess the repossessed? No, we repossessed your stuff for a reason. We asked if you had any debts and you just wrote SOS. Yeah. Listen, I've seen your services around town. We'll send you a care package to help you get back on your feet. But until then, sir, this is a Domino's. I thought you said this was a bank. Yeah, a night bank. I'll make this work. The classics. Games you may not play all the time, but the idea you can play them on your current system and pull them out whenever and wherever you are, it helps you sleep at night. And honest to God, what's better to fiddle in your pocket with an ice climber? This is a lineup of games released for the Game Boy Advance throughout 2004, titled the Classic NES series. Old school games for the Nintendo Entertainment System re-released on GBA for 20 bucks a pop. You can beat that deal. This is one of Nintendo's first major instances of really pushing nostalgia for that NES era, releasing these games alongside a special edition Game Boy Advance SP modeled after the system. Same thing in Japan, they released a model of the handheld designed after the Japanese NES, the Famicom. Look how tiny this box is, it's adorable! I think the North American variant wins in the handheld aesthetic departments though. I mean, yeah, it does mimic the Famicom, but oh boy, ketchup and mayonnaise. Now, the Famicom released in 1983, the NES released in 1985. All of this happened in 2004, so I think they were trying to break even for the system's 20th anniversary. They were probably just rounding up. Yeah, I'm 24, though I always round up, so to be more precise, I'm two. I, for one, am sort of critical of Nintendo's over-reliance on nostalgia sometimes, but I'm their target demographic for this, because no matter what they do, if it's 8-bit, I don't think, I just clap. Like, man, you're really pushing things here. They had the nerve to sell Ice Climber for $20. Yeah, $20 was cheaper than regular Game Boy Advance games, so this isn't a regular Game Boy Advance game, it's Ice Climber. But this NES Game Boy Advance SP is so cool. The outside is like the system, but the inside is like the controller. It's even textured like an actual NES gamepad. Okay, so I really like this design, but it just reminds me of the people who wear NES t-shirts. I'm awkward. The Game Boy Micro also got a special edition themed around the Famicom, this time the controller. This one released in 2005 in both Japan and the US, and I think this design eclipses both SPs. It is gorgeous. Though this was released specifically in commemoration of the 20th anniversary with no real ties to the classic NES series. Well, 12 games were released under the classic NES series label, with most hitting store shelves on June 2nd, 2004, alongside the special edition SP, plus a few more later on October 25th, 2004. Most of them were Nintendo developed and published titles. We got Super Mario Brothers, The Legend of Zelda, Donkey Kong, Excite Bike, Ice Climber, Dr. Mario, Metroid, and Zelda 2. Though there were also a few third party games licensed to Nintendo for release in the series Pac Man, Bomberman, Xevious, and Castlevania. Aesthetically speaking, these are really fun to put all next to each other. They all follow a basic black design, reminiscent of the original black box Nintendo releases. However, most of these games didn't originally have the black box design, one with a few sprites and the big title in that iconic font, so Nintendo gave them a black box design. They cropped their box arts and put them on black. It's a little lame. I think it would have been fun to actively design covers as if these games had the black box design from back in the day or something, rather than just putting the cover on a black background. I mean, at this point, you already have the top of the box saying classic NES series, you could have just used the original box art not cropped and everything would have still looked uniform and nice. But no, you just had to put more effort in to make it look like you put less effort in. The boxes do feel like many NES game boxes though, I'll give them that. The back descriptions and screenshots are unique compared to the NES originals mentioning how the NES classic is back. Finally, play Pac-Man on the go for the 20th time ever. But they still feel very genuinely charming and retro. Even if they don't cost a lot on eBay right now, you still want to treat them with respect. Most of these releases were born to die being a collectible. The next big indicator of a classic NES series title is the cartridge itself. Now most people would probably go, What's the difference? And to that I say, invest in Neon. Classic NES GBA games are a lighter tone of gray, the exact same lighter tone of gray as legitimate NES game cartridges. They put so much damn detail in all of this, this truly feels like they legitimately cared. Turns out they did these few things just to barely reach that bar. Alright, so let's try these out. First up, we can't go wrong with a little bit of Super Mario Brothers. 
unless you use it as insulin. Look at that, in all its glory. You know, I can't understate how amazing it was to finally get these games in an uncompromised portable form. Put a D in front of that. So this is Super Mario Brothers on the NES, on the Game Boy Advance. However, fun and quirk of the Game Boy Advance was the screen size. It's not four by three, it's not widescreen. I consider it husky. NES games were all four by three, so Nintendo had two options, either put black bars on the sides like a Samaritan or embrace chaos. So they filled the screen, good for them. I'm sure if they didn't, the group of people who play retro games stretched with smoothing filters on, minimized with borders, well, there's no telling what they'd do. Our nation is separated. They didn't just simply stretch the games to fill the screen, though, they meticulously removed unnecessary pixels to effectively fit the game in this wonky resolution. Thus, whatever the f this is. You have to give them credit. They wanted to see these games fill the screen and they did it without simply stretching them, though they still look a little wonky. But hey, let's see if I can compare this to similar releases. Here we have Super Mario Brothers Deluxe on Game Boy Color. It's similarly a version of Super Mario Brothers you can play on the go. So here's the advantage you get with the classic NES series. They didn't just zoom into the screen. With Deluxe sometimes you can't see what's above you, behind you, in front of you because they just zoomed in to make everything viewable on such a tiny screen. So the GBA version is a bit more playable but you're missing the calendar. Super Mario Brothers Deluxe was a new deluxe version of Mario 1. It included extra modes, a save feature, Mario 2 from Japan was included, tons of little bonus features that I just adore. Like, come on, is this necessary? No, and that's what's fun about it. Classic NES series Super Mario Brothers is just Super Mario Brothers. There's nothing else to it. And that's what the classic NES series was. They weren't remakes. They were by and large the original NES games, no frills for your Game Boy Advance. I mean, pressing L and R brings us this menu. Ooh. Damn, everybody, let's talk about the weather app. Well, Super Mario Brothers is a classic game. It's one that'll never get old and one that's great to have at a moment's notice. It plays well here, and while it was possible to play the game in some capacity on the Game Boy Advance before, this version is much more tailor-made for the handheld while also being more true to the original. Of course, it had to be a part of the classic NES series. Now, is it worth the $20 MSRP? Well, for like $10 more, you could get any of the Mario Advance series, which were fully fleshed out remakes and ports of the other 2D Mario games, including some new levels, mechanics, modes, the side game of Mario Brothers. It's a tough situation because the entire gimmick of these releases is that, oh, it's the original NES game on a smaller cartridge. Now, honestly, making these collections or something would have taken away from that collectability, I guess. And $20, I mean, that's kind of the bare minimum you can price a physical game without discounts or price cuts. I'd say this one is a bit iffy on if it makes sense for 20. At the time, you could definitely find a copy of Super Mario Brothers Deluxe for less, which had more features. Plus, back in 2004, I think our nation was more used to screen crunch like this. I'd put this in the middle on the worth 20 scale. Uh, next up, Ice Climber. I think Nintendo re-released this for a tax break. Ice Climber is an iconic NES classic. Sure. Most of its appeal comes from the character's inclusion in Smash Brothers, which is 100% why the game was put in this series. Smash Brothers Melee did a number to the interest in various franchises. It's what convinced Nintendo to bring Fire Emblem outside of Japan, so I think they decided to re-release Ice Climber for that very same reason. <laughs> Can't wait for that return on investment. The original Ice Climber isn't a terrible game. It's just a bad one. I think there's a bit of merit to this game. Like the controls are absolutely atrocious, but I think that's partially on purpose to give the game more challenge. But you can select any level from the start. So it's like, who cares about the challenge? There, I beat the game. The two player mode was seemingly removed that remained in Super Mario Brothers, but the multiplayer in that game is just past the Game Boy when you die. But alas, you have to connect another Game Boy Advance to have the option appear. Good. For $20, no, hell, I'll pay you $20 to stay away. It has its charm and a place in Nintendo history. I do sort of like it in some respects. Its core gameplay is fairly enjoyable. It's just the damn controls, man. But as nice as I'm willing to be about this game, let's be fair. This game as its standalone Game Boy Advance release, f that. <laughs> This should be nothing more than a side game in a bigger game, like Mario Brothers Arcade and the Mario Advance releases. And I think what stings the most here is the fact that Nintendo already re-released Ice Climber as an e-reader card set for the Game Boy Advance. Yeah, so this was a major piece of criticism against the classic NES series. The fact that a good handful of these games, well, they were already on the Game Boy Advance via e-reader cards. Though, let's be reasonable here, the e-reader was an accessory for the GBA that nobody heard of until two sentences ago. You'd scan cards to unlock goodies and games 
would play games right off the cards. Thus, some NES games were re-released via this method for five bucks a pack. Of course, you already had to own the e-reader, which cost $40 in of itself, keep the e-reader plugged in the entire time, and hopelessly scan five cards in a row. The opportunity cost may outweigh things here. It's a little unfair to be like, oh, well, you sold Ice Climber for $5, Nintendo. Why is it 20 now? Because you already had to own an e-reader. Scanning cards was clunky compared to just inserting a cartridge. Just buying the classic NES series game is a simpler option here. Doesn't mean the game is worth 20. Excite Bike. Now this has more value than Ice Climber in my opinion. I think everybody likes Excite Bike. Either that or nobody cares enough to put energy into hating it. Wow, you hate Excite Bike? You fucking badass. While it is the same game as before, you can save your custom build tracks now. It's not that elegant. You don't get a ton of save slots like you do in the 3D Classics remake for 3DS, but it's a noticeable upgrade from how the game operated on NES. This was another game that was already on e-reader card, so that was an issue. You can save your custom tracks in that version, so I finally understand the value of $15. Excite Bike's a better game than Ice Climber, though, and has more replay value. I'd say it's in the middle on the $20 scale. Donkey Kong. Plain ass, old ass, Donkey Kong ass, Donkey Kong. To answer your question, it's not the arcade version, it's the NES version. What did you you think we've been talking about. Donkey Kong's always fun to replay, but I mean, it's just three levels, one screen each. And the NES version, while well, perfectly fine, it cuts out one of the stages from the arcade game, the Pie Factory. So it's like, did, sure, you can use this game to just try to go for the high score, but wouldn't that feel more rewarding if you had the true arcade version in the palm of your hands? You could practice and practice and practice on Game Boy and show up to the arcade, get the high score and in tandem laid. Ah, uh, this is just a way to play Donkey Kong on the go, but at that point, just get Donkey Kong for Game Boy. That original arcade game was remade and there's 90 plus puzzle platformer levels afterwards and that game cost around like four bucks in 2004. Plus Donkey Kong was another e-reader release. Also they could have re-released Donkey Kong Classics which was Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. on one NES cartridge. I know the whole gimmick is it's the original authentic one NES game now on your GBA, but like, come on, $20? I love the original Donkey Kong, but this is pushing it, frankly, I don't think it's worth it. The Legend of Zelda, see, this is one of those games they forced the black box design on. Like, it looks fine and standardized with the rest of the series, but would it have really looked that out of place with the original box art design just with the red header on top? This was the first time Zelda 1 was available portably, and it's an incredibly solid version. They even went in and fixed up some text here in the beginning that was in a dire need of an editor in the original. I think Zelda works great as a handheld game. If this was your first time playing, it can take a while to get through if you don't immediately know where to go, and I think portability helps as you can kind of chip away at it. I would have loved to see a remake of this game on Game Boy Advance, a la how Nintendo remade Metroid 1 as Metroid Zero Mission, but for $20, I think this was a standout release. You would definitely get your money's worth out of this game. Until two years later when Nintendo re-released it on Wii's Virtual Console for $5. All right, so those were the Nintendo games on June 2nd. What about the third parties? I am sorry I asked. Bomberman by Hudson. Now, Nintendo still published these Game Boy Advance versions, and I'm sure they developed these ports, but this was always a Hudson Soft property. But Bomberman has always been there for most Nintendo platforms. I'm sure some people think of him as a Nintendo character. Hell, he's been in Nintendo games with Nintendo characters. So this makes sense. On paper, one of the defining elements of Bomberman games is the multiplayer mode, and it's not locked behind a link cable, it's just not here! It's just the single player mode from the NES game, it's fine, but you do realize how many ways there were to play Bomberman on Game Boy Advance, right? I mean, most Bomberman games are kind of interchangeable, a Bomberman game is a Bomberman game. Some are better than others, but at the end of the day, most will give you your Bomberman fix. So it's like... All of these exist, you know? And Bomberman's known for multiplayer. You take it out of the equation and the main game is okay, but it's so strange to me that they went to all this trouble to preserve elements of these other titles, but strip Bomberman of its headlining feature. No! Pac-Man, it's the NES version, of course, and I've been critical of this one before. Listen, it's not a bad addition of the game at all. I just don't like when products claim to have Pac-Man included and it's the damn NES version of the game. You're telling me me I got horny for nothing? Like the graphics and sound are just different enough to make this feel kinda lame. This is one of the strangest inclusions to the series. Pac-Man was already well represented on the Game Boy Advance. You had Namco Museum with the original arcade version alongside a handful of other Namco classics and Pac-Man Collection which had Pac-Man and various other games from the series. Both of these games came out well before the classic NES series release of Pac-Man so it's fair to say you could find them for $20 or less at this point. So this just feels like a waste. Why would you buy this outside of collector's purposes? There's no reason for this to exist. I think Nintendo did this one because it's Pac-Man. 
It's not like it's an iconic NES game, but I think it kind of helped bring more eyes to the lineup. Like, everybody knows Pac-Man, and it kind of reminds them of the NES era, so... Sure, I didn't need lunch today. It's like on the front of the NES Classic Edition mini console box. Like, why is Pac-Man highlighted here? There are so many other games iconic to the NES that they could have chosen to represent. Instead, did you say Pac-Man? And finally, we had Xevious on this day, another Namco arcade classic getting its NES version re-released. They added auto-fire to this version, which is kind of nice, but other than that, it's Xevious. Oh my god, finally. At least this game wasn't available elsewhere on Game Boy Advance, so good for me, I get it all to myself. But I'm an American, alright? If there's two things I don't care about, it's my morals and Xevious. This game was far more popular in Japan, and while I think it's still fairly well known over here, there are so many other NES games. Hell, Namco or Nintendo developed and published games that would have made so much more sense for a classic NES series re-release. A fine game, it's a little too high score centric for me to consider it worth the $20, though I think it's at the very least half worth it. And that was the first wave of the classic NES series. Cool collectibles that just didn't have a ton of value outside of that. The games they picked were so basic, it made it difficult to warrant picking some of these up, which I think they tried to rectify this complaint with the second and final wave. On October 25th, 2004, we got four more titles. First up, Dr. Mario. Ugh, guys, come on. Did you really have to put black bars around the artwork? Who cares? Most of the image is the artwork anyways. Just go all the way. Especially the third party games I just went over. These just look bad. Pac-Man probably looks the best. Bomberman, they cropped out most of the artwork and the original box would have just been so easy to translate over. And Xevious, well, they just didn't care. Dr. Mario is a safe bet being a puzzle game. You'll for sure get your time out of this one. If you wanted to play a Dr. Mario game on the handheld, this was giving you exactly what you were looking for. You could have gotten the original Game Boy version. Now, that one technically sold better than the NES one, so more people may have had memories of this one, strangely enough. But for a game all about matching light colors, stay away. Though there were more ways to play Dr. Mario on GBA. In WarioWare Mega Micro Games, you could unlock the Dr. Wario game, which was fundamentally NES Dr. Mario, just with a few sprites changed. And a year after this classic NES series release, you could pick up Dr. Mario and Puzzle League, which included a much better version of Dr. Mario and another puzzle game entirely. The best puzzle game entirely. You know what, I'll say this was worth the 20 bones. At least at the time. I mean, this was perfect for the pick up and play style. There wasn't a Dr. Mario on the system natively at the time. The closest thing was an unlockable minigame in WarioWare, and that wasn't like a full port of NES Dr. Mario. It was a joke inclusion that could also effectively double as a Dr. Mario alternative in a pinch. And Dr. Mario and Puzzle League came out afterwards, so you can't really blame them for that. I will give this my full praises it might have been worth $20. Metroid, all right, this kind of works with the black box design considering Metroid was one of the games that followed the template but used silver for some reason. If anything, this box actually might look better than the original. Metroid can be hard to go back to, especially without a map system. It's hard to know where to go and even where you are, which is why I would recommend the remake on Game Boy Advance, Metroid Zero Mission. It does a phenomenal job contextualizing that original NES game as a modern title. It has quality of life improvements without feeling too easy or like it's holding your hand while also featuring tons of added content. It's the definitive way to experience the first game in the series. And it came out in February of 2004 and included the original NES Metroid in its entirety as an unlockable for beating the game. I guess this is for the people who wanted to play the original Metroid on GBA but didn't want to put in the work to beat Metroid Zero Mission to unlock it. Honey, if you want to play Metroid 1 but not Metroid Zero Mission, that's your own damn fault. This is just weird. I mean, the version of Metroid included in Zero Mission is basically the exact same. There are a few discrepancies, like some sprites look a little different in the Zero Mission version, but they're both NES Metroid. There's no true differences. It's hard to imagine Metroid not being a part of this series. I get that. But when you already released Metroid Zero Mission earlier that year, it just feels unnecessary. If it were the other way around and this came out before Zero Mission, then sure. But no, instead, they're forcing me to bitch about it 17 years later. The horse. Bastards! Zelda 2 The Adventure Link. Following in the steps of the Zelda 1 box design-wise, this is another solid investment. Zelda 2 may not have been the most beloved Zelda title, but it's still a good game. It's just different, and the amount of playtime you get out of it, well, I think it makes it well worth the $20 price tag. And finally, Castlevania, the last classic NES series title and another third-party one by Konami. Come on, guys. It's just a really stupid cropping of the silver box art. Like, really? I think this is also well worth the investment. Castlevania was already in a renaissance on the Game Boy Advance with three original titles on it. Those followed in the footsteps of Castlevania Symphony of the Night, so there was still a void of classic Castlevania. 
and I think this was a great addition to the lineup. Well, that's the classic NES series. For collectors, this is a pretty fun series. It's cool to have these miniature NES boxes and great cartridges and try to go for them all. But for players, I just feel like there's not enough there to warrant a purchase. These games were just kind of neat little novelties, but that was about it. The only games I think that you could actually warrant a purchase on were Zelda 1, 2, and Castlevania. But they were kind of cool releases just for the novelty alone. And just like that, Japan told us to go f ourselves. These are the Japanese versions of the classic NES series, titled the Famicom miniseries. They went above and beyond in Japan. First off, the packaging its entirely unique, unlike traditional GBA game boxes. A clear plastic container with numerous cardboard inserts holding an exact replica of the original box art, now the size of a matchbox. The instructions are all folded up nice and neat. These just feel like so much love and attention was put into them. Even games that originally had different box dimensions on the Famicom, they accommodated for them, and games that released via the Famicom disc system, well, they have their own style of box as well. And because the disc system games were yellow, the carts are too! The standard games have a color scheme reminiscent of the Famicom console, not the cartridges because they were all different kinds of colors. It would have been really cool if they used the same colors each cartridge was originally, but this is still neat. The games themselves, it's the same story as before, except these are the Japanese versions. But Japan got dozens more games on top of every single one that released in North America. Mario Brothers, Balloon Fight, Clue Clue Land, Wrecking Crew, Famicom Detective Club 1 and 2, Kid Icarus, The Mysterious Murasame Castle, Shin Onigashima, Super Mario Brothers 2, Mappy, Star Soldier, SD Gundam World, Dig Dug, Gone Bear Goemon, Ghost and Goblins, Adventure Island, and Twin Bee were all Japan exclusives. And my god, why did we get Ice Climber out of all of these? There were so many games that I think would have made perfect sense in North America. I mean, come on, Dig Dug and you gave a Xevious? I know Dig Dug was already on Namco Museum, but still like, why did we get Xevious? I think this lineup of games does a far better job representing the NES or Famicom technically. I think Contra, Mega Man, Bubble Bobble, Punch-Out, River City Ransom, Double Dragon, Tecmo Bowl, Kung Fu, those seem like they would have been easy to get as a part of the series and would have really helped to lock this in as the perfect celebration of the console that started it all. But these will do. I have similar complaints towards why some of these got the re-release. Like, Mario Brothers? Really? That was included in damn near every Mario game on the Game Boy Advance, and it was a much better version than the NES game. Each day Nintendo re-releases Clue Clue Land, I hear gunshots. However, the Famicom Detective Club games? Well, those are huge titles. I can't play them at all, but these were great inclusions for Japanese-speaking players. Balloon Fight I would have preferred compared to Ice Climber over here. There's just far more variety, basically, because there was more released. And they made sure you knew that by releasing these boxes. Japan's Club Nintendo loyalty program offered these collection boxes containing every game from the Famicom miniseries at the time. They came in unique mailers and sliding them out, we have some of the coolest collectibles I've ever laid eyes on. Three volumes, the first two being the cartridge-based games, the third disc system. Each one has this amazing slipcover featuring sprite art from the games included. Opening them up, we get each of the games nestled and displayed with a plaque. This is the kind of treatment I love to see video games get. This almost looks like something you'd see in the Football Hall of Fame, but way cooler. Like, oh, that's the football Malcolm Butler intercepted in the Super Bowl? Like, who gives a sh dude? That's f***ing Dig Dug! Now, this collection doesn't include two specific titles, Mobile Suit Z Gundam Hot Scramble and Second Super Robot Wars. The former being a limited 2,000 copy print run giveaway to owners of a Gundam game on GameCube, the latter being just a straight up purchase bonus for another GameCube game, and buy that game, get this one. These ones were released later on after the initial Famicom miniseries wrapped up, but I'm happy with just these. They've been some of my most wanted collectibles for a while now. I've always loved the look of them, and on top of that, they're functional. I have practically the entire Famicom mini collection by owning these. I can get used to this whole owning thing again. Well, that worked. I'm gonna need more stuff to talk about for the coming weeks, though. Yeah, it's no. Hey y'all, Scott here. Gosh, I wanna play this video game, but it's just too complicated. I don't know. Bingo! How do you know Grandpa will like a video game? 
I just know. But hey, sometimes it can be hard to tell, which is where Nintendo comes into the picture. See, during the reign of the Nintendo DS and Wii systems, more people than ever before were picking these things up to play a bit of Brain Age, Nintendogs, Wii Fit, games that anybody could understand regardless of their level of gaming know-how. Which is why Nintendo started labeling these games as, you fucking idiot, you don't know as much as I did. Seriously, you later known as touch generations yeah you ever pick up a game from one of these two systems and notice that little logo in the corner i mean it was pretty easy to put two and two together pretty much any game with the touch generations logo was very accessible and appealed to a much wider demographic than 25 year old white boy it makes you wonder why they chose the name touch generations when they could have gone for the much more blatant buy this grandpa because what does this mean is this logo supposed to speak to the casuals like that's me! But hey, anything to help Grandpa buy me a video game can't hurt. <laughs> Grandpa, that's arsenic! Touch Generations isn't a series per se, rather a marketing line, giving specific DS and Wii games the logo to show how they're fine-tuned for a general audience, unlike some games like Fossil Fighters. D Dad, stay away! This logo was introduced on June 5th, 2006 here in North America with the games Big Brain Academy and Magnetica, and shortly after, many previously released titles would be re-released with the logo now in the box arts corner. Was anything else changed? Uh, the printer used more ink. This logo is something added after the fact. It never really felt like Nintendo went out of their way to create Touch Generations games. They would make their games and decide later on if it fit the requirements. Now, what were the requirements? This line spanned dozens upon dozens of titles across North America, Europe, Australia, and Japan, some only carrying the Touch Generations logo in specific countries, while either releasing in other regions like normal or staying exclusive to specific ones. If you want to experience everything Touch Generations had to offer, I mean, man, there are over 50 titles with this branding, and some games that have it in North America don't have it in Europe, and vice versa. There's so many Japanese exclusives. Did everybody who comes up to me for advice on where to start with the Touch Generations Generations games. There's nobody here. Thank God, I got nothing. Might as well take a look at all these to see what makes a Touch Generations game a Touch Generations game. Going in no particular order, let's start with Nintendogs. Nintendogs was an absolute phenomenon, being released as numerous different versions, which just changed what breed of dogs you can select at the start. This was one of the best pet simulators of all time. I mean, look at how well animated these dogs are for being 3D models on the damn Nintendo DS. It effectively used the DS touchscreen to the best of its ability, showing how this is a game that just wouldn't have been the same on the PlayStation Portable or on a home console with a standard controller. You needed a touchscreen. You needed a microphone to scream at mammals. And it's all so damn intuitive. It's the first input method you think of when you see a polygonal dog. It all came together. Playing it now, the original Nintendogs is ridiculously simple. It's just a solid loop of feed dog, clean dog, play dog, walk dog, train dog, wean cash. It's still incredibly charming, but I do think a lot of that feeling comes from nostalgia. I played this to death back in 2007. Everything from what you were doing down to how you were doing it was so damn novel. Thus, let's do some math here. We have a pet simulator, which looking at the craze surrounding Tamagotchis, we know those are big. Using a touch screen and microphone in 2005 to do things like pet a virtual animal and also do some light voice recognition which I'm pretty sure around this time, we were all struck at light up shoes. Couple that with the pet we were raising being dogs, puppies, not some weird ass creature made up for the game. Now you show this to dad and he goes, that's a dog. Pretty easy to see how Nintendogs appeal to everybody with its simple and intuitive controls, easy to grasp concept with a theme most general consumers wouldn't be embarrassed to admit they're playing a game about. Ew, you're playing that? and not the sequel. Nintendogs was destined for success, especially in 2005 when we really hadn't seen something like this work so well and be so understandable. And this was all a part of then Nintendo president Satoru Iwata's blue ocean strategy, which was to focus on a market that was untapped rather than compete in a market that's already well established, in this case being more core gaming experiences you'd find on the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. Let's try and attract other people to the world of gaming with different games, 
simpler games, controllable in intuitive and fun ways. Thus, the Wii, Nintendo DS, and the Touch Generations line as a whole start to make a whole lot more sense. Hey, you can hate these types of games all you want. I'm a gamer, I don't wanna pet a dog, I wanna fuck my wife. But you can't deny these led to the insane sales numbers we're seeing with gaming these days. The Touch Generations introduced so many to the world of video games who later went on to try more in-depth experiences. So yeah, these games are are more important than I think people give them credit for. Remove this from the timeline and like, I might be missing a limb. 100 classic books, what were you expecting? As far as I'm concerned, this game does everything it sets out to do, unlike others. Where the fuck are the slugs? This title was developed by Genius Seniority after they made Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness. I think Nintendo caught on to how that game used words. So on to 100 classic books for them, a collection of 100 public domain writings from the 1800s. These are all free. What was stopping them from doing 101? And without tiny the DS screens are, they had to blow up the text, so you pretty much get two sentences per page now. A book like The Time Machine by H.D. Wells is normally around 84 pages long. In 100 classic books, you Using the smallest font size option, it is now 649 pages long. And that's just the price you have to pay to pay $20 for 100 public domain books. Come on, man, I can print off PDFs of all these books for free. Okay, so do it. The point is, f Nintendo. This is one of the most non games Nintendo's ever created and doesn't even have an ESRB rating. Though we do have quizzes to take in order to figure out what book we're in the mood for. For what it is, I do find 100 classic books to have a ton of pre smartphone revolution charm, you know? Something that has absolutely no use today, but you can think back to the late 2000s, early 2010s, and see how this could be kind of convenient. Sure, e readers like the Kindle and smartphones and tablets were taking off, but they weren't nearly as popular as they are today. So the idea of reading a book on your DS wasn't too absurd. And that can be attributed to the fact many Touch Generations titles, including this one, use the Nintendo DS on its side, like a book. For casual users, I bet this felt far more natural, especially in a game where you're using the stylus to write. And the most iconic title that did this was easily Brain Age. This, alongside Nintendogs, dominated the list of best-selling Nintendo DS games. They helped propel the DS as a standard in anybody's pocket, young or old. It didn't matter, everybody owned Brain Age, because everybody was stupid enough to think it would work. You really thought you'd get smarter by doing 10 math problems a day? It's no wonder the United States cracked down on games claiming to train your brain. Thank God. Well, while a game like Brain Age isn't gonna make you smarter, it for sure can make you sharper. Presented by Dr. Kawashima, Real guy, just in this game, they took some artistic liberties. He was responsible for loads of studies and eventually a book detailing how basic math problems and other mental exercises can aid in avoiding issues like dementia, for example. Now that doesn't mean this is the surefire way to cure that kind of stuff, but it can help many stay on top of things and what better way to utilize this research than to create a video game out of it to make it as easy as possible for users to follow Dr. Kawashima's advice. Quick math problems, puzzles, and mental exercises presented in a way that feels more like a high score based video game rather than homework. That's what makes Brain Age special. It has some of the most basic, boring sounding content at its core, math, but turns it into something where you want to get better at solving problems and faster at solving problems. Oh my God. That's five gallons of water. Writing out numbers and letters with the stylus mostly works okay. Nintendo, whatever you say in front of me, you can say in front of my fives. We even have a Sudoku mode. Well, I have some books, so we'll decline. But let's be fair here. Sudoku and Brain Age may be the greatest adaptation of the game. I love how you only have five mistakes you can make. It really makes you critically think a lot more, and when you get a number right, the ding sound is so satisfying. It's easy to write Brain Age off as just math homework with gimmicks to make it all feel more gamey, but there's far more depth to it than it may initially seem seem. It actually incentivizes you to get better and better at math problems while also being fun. It must be a witch! Following up that title was Brain Age 2, which is less of a sequel and more of a second volume. It's not like Brain Age brought to the next level, it's more so Brain Age with different minigames. So I'd say Brain Age 2 isn't really Brain Age 2, it's another Brain Age. These are completely interchangeable. If you didn't play one of them, I don't think that means you're missing out on anything. I think that just means you're a coward. But just a few months after the first Brain Age's release, Nintendo launched Big Brain Academy. What does this game do differently? 
uh, deserve at least a teen rating. I never realized how close to each other these two released, which definitely makes me question why. Big Brain Academy is more of a game than Brain Age, which makes me feel like I'm some kind of guinea pig doing an experiment. Big Brain is more colorful and lively with less of an emphasis on math and more on brain teasers. I guess. It's really hard to say, oh, well, this is why Brain Age exists, and this is why Big Brain Academy exists. Because while they're visually distinct, at the end of the day, these are pretty much the same type of thing. I guess Brain Age is more aimed at older people while Big Brain Academy is targeted at kids? <laughs> Okay. Flash Focus was marketed similarly to Brain Age, having a comparable tagline on the front cover. This one's all about training your eyes, being more aware of your surroundings while also staying relaxed. This one doesn't hit nearly as hard as the brain training games. Uh, see, those worked because the mini games included were very much the type of things you'd find in homework, but now made fun. You know, that was the point of that title. It gave it purpose, it made it unique. The activities in Flash Focus are like follow the ball under the cup, which is the most overused type of minigame. You'd find that in any Mario Party, yet here, it's stripped down to the bare minimum visually. Sure, that was fine in Brain Age, but here, it feels like they forgot to finish the game. Other exercises can be more visually appealing, but like, this does nothing for me. How is this training my vision? I'm just playing a boxing mini game. If this thing was actually used to judge one's sight, oh, no more corrective lenses for me. Sudoku Gridmaster. Now, I did really enjoy Sudoku in Brain Age, so a full game of nothing but? Why wouldn't you just buy Brain Age? That had Sudoku plus Brain Age. Sudoku Gridmaster is just Sudoku, and it isn't as intuitive or snappy as the mode in Brain Age. There are 400 puzzles in this one, though, compared to Brain Age's 100, but after the 100th Sudoku puzzle, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to remember the solutions to the first one, so who cares? Just replay them. This is a perfectly fine Sudoku game at the end of the day, but it's similar to Big Brain Academy in the sense that it has so many of the same things Brain Age has, while also being published by Nintendo within a three-month window of Brain Age's release. Why not just buy Brain Age? Well, why not be the Gridmaster? <laughs> Damn, they got me. Crosswords DS, or Crossword DS. Has Nintendo ever officially said how to pronounce this title? That's the price you pay for being cute. This is a collection of crossword puzzles. And word searches. This is just nice, you know? There's not much more to it. It feels like Sudoku from Brain Age, but crosswords. There's loads of puzzles, word searches if you're a fucking baby. This... I can see my parents enjoying quite a lot, so it really seems like the Touch Generations line is for them with a gun to their head. Yeah, let's get into some titles that carry the logo that just really should have carried anything else. Not that these are bad games, far from it, but like, Jesus, dude, you're scaring grandpa. Elite Beat Agents, Rhythm Heaven, Hotel Dusk, Room 215. These are all Touch Generations games, much like how I'm one too. These are all DS classics that are, yes, easier to understand and pick up and play compared to the Dark Spire. But I mean, to my dad, there's not a damn difference between these two. These are a lot more flashy, in your face, and complex compared to the other titles. These are actual video games. Elite Beat Agents is one of the DS's best. It's a rhythm game based on a Japanese-only title that used these guys instead of agents. North America loves agents. But we also love, like, ducks, so I'd be interested to see the reason behind this choice. This game is pure wacky-ass Nintendo. The same wacky-ass Nintendo you'd only expect to see in the Japan-only joints, but no. This is a heavily westernized version of a game from Japan. The visuals are all so mesmerizing to watch. It's over the top and knows that. This game just aims to be fun, not only with presentation, but the gameplay as well. Tap the circles that appear in order to the beat. It's very easy to understand, but incredibly difficult to master, which is a crucial element of some of the greatest games of all time. And do they have a cover of Skater Boy? There's only 19 songs featured throughout the whole game, and they are all covers, but I will give Nintendo this. They are all licensed tracks from actual artists, unlike other rhythm games they've done, where the most they can do is the fucking Pledge of Allegiance. But here, these are legitimate songs, and while they are covers, they're pretty good covers. It all just adds up to this being an essential game in anybody's DS library, except for dad. Well, yeah, the gameplay is easy to understand. This does stick out quite a bit as a touch generations game. It feels more like they made it one to potentially ease casual players to try something with some kick to it and thus help a game in a brand new series sell a little better. Damn, if that's what this logo can do, why not put it on 
everything. Rhythm Evan is another game I find to be a little peculiar here. I mean, the way Nintendo advertised it initially was almost like this was another form of brain age. Oh, I have to get my rhythm training in for the day. They went above and beyond to attract the casual audience here, creating a whole marketing campaign centered around Beyonce just simply playing the game. Oh man, if Beyonce's playing it, it must be real. Pretty wild the game was marketed like this initially because I don't know about you, but when I think Rhythm Evan these days, my mind doesn't go to something they'd get. This series can be so damn difficult sometimes, and the DS one, for me personally, is more complicated than the other entries. Okay, complicated. A branch is more complicated than a stick. Just how the others simply use one button, this one, we use the touchscreen and flick it sometimes. Ooh. Regardless, Rhythm Evan is a joy. One of the most unique and lovable rhythm games of all time. Even if you're real bad at it, you still end each minigame with a smile. Unlike Elite Beat Agents, which actively is telling you exactly when you need to tap the circle, Rhythm Evan plays everything out in a way where just glancing at it, some people may not realize it's a music game. These are all completely different minigames, but at their core, they're all about keeping the beat, listening to audio cues, and watching the visuals to know the exact right time to tap or hold or flick. It's really cool because something like the Rhythm Rally game, you could technically play that like it was just a standard ping pong game. It would be damn hard, but that prepares you for the rest of life. My uncle died. I've dealt with harder. Rhythm Heaven is so unique with how it crafts rhythm minigames that conceptually have nothing to do with rhythm. And because of that, it simultaneously creates a rhythm game that doesn't just involve hitting the right button when the icon hovers over the right area like any other rhythm game. I think contextualizing rhythm in these ways can actually really help you understand music better. I find myself nodding my head to the beat way more playing Rhythm Heaven than in G Guitar Hero, for example. And because of that, like, yeah, honestly, now I can see why Nintendo may have marketed the game like this. In some ways, it is kind of like Brain Age for music, just with a much more fun presentation. Don't get me wrong, this looks fun in one of those less fun than Rhythm Heaven kind of ways like taxes. But out of all the games under the Touch Generations label, Rhythm Heaven is one of the most unique, well-designed, and everlasting experiences. We'll get to True Swing Golf. But for now, Hotel Dusk Room 215. Finally, something other than gas prices to confuse the elders. A point-and-click adventure game with 3D first-person movement using the touchscreen. Translation for the casuals? It just says no. I get why Nintendo may have considered this a game anybody can get into, a mystery visual novel type experience. Most people can understand that, though I feel this gets a bit too ambitious for a general audience. An impressive game on the DS by all accounts, I mean, they really pushed to create a unique experience visually and gameplay wise. There's not much else like Hotel Dusk, but I feel like a game like Professor Layton is far more casual friendly with that also being a puzzle game with point and click elements, but guess what got the Touch Generation's blessing? Well, that too. Electroplankton. Don't fucking try that. Another game that, oh, I already fucked up. I think it's a bit much to call this a game. It's pretty much a musical, visual, interactive fish moment. Oh, it's one of those, huh? Electroplankton is more of an experiment. One that encourages the player to harness their artistic side, to make eloquent movements via the touchscreen, to craft unique music heard nowhere else. That's the funny way to say, poke the fish, they scream loud. I don't dislike this experience, but that's all it is, an experience. An experience I find fairly limited in its appeal, one that was sold for $30. You can save the sounds you create, there's nothing to do other than move the electroplankton around to make interesting noises that can sometimes end up sounding like actual music. It's something you could imagine being displayed in an art or science museum, something you could walk right up to and interact with and then move on to the next attraction, which is exactly what the designer, Toshio Iwai, was known known for, interactive art focusing on music that looks exactly like electroplankton. Within that context, electroplankton makes so much more sense, just not as a $30 retail game. It retains the spirit of Toshio Iwai's work, but because of that, it really does feel like an attraction you admire for five minutes and then move on. So there's value here as an art piece, just not as a game. It's completely understandable as to why it received a limited release here in North America, and how later on they divided the game up into 10 separate applications on the Nintendo DSi shop for two bones a pop. The problem is, I already thought the game was lacking in content as a full release, now you're releasing one tenth of Electroplankton? This is a crumb! But as a Touch Generations title, I mean, I think mom could play this, I'm just not sure she know why she's playing it. Really interesting and undeniably unique, Electroplankton is a cool, Thing. 
I just think it needs more meat on its bones. If you're gonna be more art piece than game, that's fine. You just can't expect me to accept it 16 years later. Now, if we want something that's more of a game, we can't do much better than the original Clubhouse games. A collection of mostly tabletop games. Cards, checkers, chess, dominoes, and even some lounge style games like darts, bowling, billiards. In total, there's 42 different games to choose from with challenges to complete via mission mode, local multiplayer, or online multiplayer. How did they make this then release Sudoku by itself? Clubhouse games is still an outstanding standing value and these games are timeless and these versions are still fun today it's easy to see where they cut corners though i mean one of the games is soda shake nintendo i don't need you for this i feel a bit spoiled because i actually played the 2020 follow-up on nintendo switch before the original and the large icons and visual variety and quality really do make it a bit harder to play the one that started it all i do find the user interface and text to be a bit too small and not as instantly understandable intuitive and inviting as its successor but at the end of the day, dots and boxes is still dots and boxes. Though again, Nintendo, I don't need you for this. Clubhouse Games has so much value that it makes other Touch Generations titles feel lacking in comparison, like True Swing Golf. It's golf. I mean, this is perfectly fine. It uses the touchscreen effectively to swing your club, meaning, yeah, I'd say this is pretty easy for anybody to pick up and play. It's also golf. That's crazy, I can get 23 minutes out of a single blind on a controller, but true swing golf, I come out dry. Now Tetris DS, I'm coming out soaked. Yeah, this was a Touch Generations game, and while I understand why, it feels like anything but. Tetris is one of the most widely played and accessible games out there. So what's the version on one of the most widely played and accessible handhelds of all time like? Oh my God, it's fucking Frog Mario. It's Tetris for me. Tetris DS's visual identity is nothing Nothing but classic NES games by Nintendo. Super Mario Brothers, The Legend of Zelda, Donkey Kong, Metroid, Ice Climber, it oddly gives Tetris DS absolutely no identity of its own, yet a ton of character at the same time. And the sheer amount of modes on this player, like Jesus Christ, they're just blocks, guys. One of the greatest Tetris games of all time. Touch generations worthy? Of course, but like, why label this as the one for everybody? Well, keeping with the puzzle games, how about Planet Puzzle League? They're just giving planets to anybody. Puzzle League, also known as Anything But. Originally a Japanese-only title named Panel Day Pond, later localized in North America as Tetris Attack, then receiving a sequel titled Pokemon Puzzle League, followed by Pokemon Puzzle Challenge, then Dr. Mario and Puzzle League, and now, none of the above. One of my favorite puzzle games. It's fucking garbage here. I mean, it's fine, but like, go from the amazing personality and charm featured in the past games to what I think a robot sees. This is Puzzle League for those who can't feel. Like, would you want to hug space? No. The color yellow? Oh, any day. This game just feels so beaten down with the casual stick. They're trying to make it as bland as possible to appeal to the everyman. And I think that ruins a lot of what makes Puzzle League so enjoyable. And plus, using the touchscreen to slide pieces around just isn't as fun or satisfying as using the buttons for me. I mean, all of this can be changed via the options. We can choose to just use buttons, swap between book style and normal style. There's even loads of different themes to choose from. But this lack of identity is baked into Planet Puzzle League's DNA. This is a meaty game overall. It has loads of modes and things to do. I think it's quite good. Probably one of the best in the overall very small and niche Puzzle League series. Though to me, it's one of the most forgettable entries due to how bland everything is. They brain aged my Tetris attack. It's like they marketed this as a brain booster, something to play once a day. If you wanted to make Tetris Attack educational, just keep the damn Yoshis and have them spout history facts. Now, Planet Puzzle League wasn't the only older Nintendo series to get a Touch Generations coat of paint. Picross DS, a new take on the Picross puzzle game formula introduced with Mario's Picross on Game Boy. And while a whole slew of variations and sequels were released in Japan, Picross DS was only the second Picross game to get a release outside of that country. Well, it's not Mario's Picross cross anymore, so I guess he didn't get the prenup. Just because Mario was featured in the original game, it didn't make this a Mario game in my opinion. There were a couple of Mario themed puzzles, but for the most part, the puzzles comprised of pretty generic things. So Picross DS being just a themeless puzzle game isn't heart-wrenching like Planet Puzzle League was. This is Picross. Use the touchscreen now, which works perfectly. There's a bunch of puzzles to complete. 
Yeah, I think this fits within the Touch Generations label. I'm sure it was originally a Game Boy game, but it definitely feels at home right next to the other titles like Crosswords DS and Sudoku Gridmaster. I can see casuals understanding and enjoying this one quite a bit. Oh my god, we have a fatality! Not ease of use! Picross 3D, an interpretation of the standard Picross formula, but now in a 3D space. Definitely harder to jump into, but far more satisfying to master. The Picross 3D is a wonderful puzzler, probably the most unique across the entire Touch Generations line, which isn't saying much. Magnetica was actually one of the first titles with the logo on them. This is a game that everybody's played a variant of at one point or another. It's officially gone under numerous other names like Puzz Loop and Ballistic, and was pretty much copied in games like Zuma. It's just a color matching puzzle game. You get random colored balls to shoot into a twisting lineup of colors, shoot it into a space where you can clear a bunch of the same color. It's fun for a bit, not much else to this one in particular, just a fine version of something that has a million different clones elsewhere. Unlike Master of Illusion. You wanna talk about games that ain't games, this is a magic kit. You dare make this for a general audience and feature this character? Mom, mom, it's Barbara the Bat. That's not a bat, those are boobs. Master of Illusion comes in this big box containing a pack of playing cards for you to test out some magic acts with. The game teaches you step by step on how to perform some tricks while also using the DS in some performances. The character Barbara the Bat was from a mostly Japan exclusive DS series, Daigasso Band Brothers, which got a Europe release Jam with the band, though never came over here to North America. Outside of a few Super Smash Brothers appearances and Super Mario Maker, Master of Illusion is her only game in this country. I always knew this slogan was full of sh. Keeping with the tutorial game genre, Art Academy. Did you know this game released as two separate smaller titles on the Nintendo DSi shop in 2009 as Art Academy first semester and second semester, with the boxed release combining the two a year later in 2010? I never knew that, I just assumed the DSiWare games came afterwards. Well, Art Academy is exactly what it sounds like. It's not a great digital art program, but it does a sufficient job in giving you some basic art lessons. It's all about teaching you the basics, laying the foundation for what may become a major hobby in the future, which is what the personal trainer series was all about. Calling it a series is pushing it though. All of these games, personal trainer cooking, math, and walking, were all developed by different people, released with different names in different regions, and all look and play nothing alike. But Nintendo of America decided to give each of them the personal trainer title. But then personal trainer cooking got a sequel, and they got rid of the personal trainer and replaced it with America's Test Kitchen. And there was a fifth game in the lineup as well, personal trainer depression. Personal trainer math doesn't really try to be anything special at all, it's just a math educational game. Personal Trainer Cooking and America's Test Kitchen Let's Get Cooking are fine little pieces of cookbook software, and Personal Trainer Walking is definitely the most Nintendo-like of the bunch, being one of the few DS games to feature Miis and coming with pedometers to track your steps. But this isn't much of a game, rather software to analyze your walking and encourage you to walk more. When Personal Trainer Math is the most game-like of the bunch, you know we've gone too deep into the Touch Generations line. What's left? Mystery Case Files Millionaire? It's Where's Waldo, but without Waldo. So it's Where's Waldo? Where the fuck is he? This is a long running PC game series that Nintendo licensed for the DS, which is definitely interesting. They could have just made their own, but hey, this is a perfectly fine little hidden object game. Nothing extraordinary, but nothing bad either. And that goes for the majority of the Touch Generations lineup on the Nintendo DS. There are some standout titles here, some that revolutionized the gaming industry. But for the most part, these are incredibly simple games, sometimes to a fault. They may be so simple they're on the verge of predatory, like assuming some chucklehead's gonna buy Sudoku Gridmaster. <laughs> but for the most part, these are all quality enough and helped push the gaming industry to include everybody, not just pre-existing video game fans. Which is why the line extended to the Nintendo Wii. Well, that makes no sense. Touch Generations on Wii is so damn minuscule, I have to ask what the point of it even was. Only a handful of titles here in North America received the branding, the first of which was Big Brain Academy Wii Degree, with the rest being a few of the Wii series titles. Strangely, games like Wii Play and Wii Party were excluded from the line here in North America, though they received it in other countries, with games like Endless Ocean 1 and 2 being labeled as such only in Europe. With these being every game with the branding worldwide, and these being every game with a branding in North America. Damn, Nintendo, you could have saved some ink, man. Not only does this feel a little out of place considering, well, 
I mean, I can touch my Wii. But the bar for what should be labeled touch generations makes no sense to me. The mystery case file's got a follow up on Wii, the Malgrave incident. Not a Touch Generations title. Over on the DS, games like Professor Layton, Polarium, Medio, Style Savvy, held the Nintendo DS browser. Why these weren't branded, but games like Hotel Dusk and Planet Puzzle League were, baffle me. I guess Nintendo just stopped valuing the brand as years went on. Uh, they kept making games in some of these series, something they still do. Which truly does hit home how Touch Generations was merely just an advertising tool outside of Japan. Inside though, it's obvious to me that the lineup of Touch Generations games in Japan were far more connected to one another. They even released a Touch Generations series soundtrack CD over there, containing a variety of music from casual games and applications from the Wii and DS. I never knew math and dogs shared a universe. There's even more to the Touch Generation series if we take a look outside of North America, but so much of it is tailor-made to the Japanese market that I got nothing. But that shows how each country considered touch generations to be a completely different thing. But that shouldn't take away the importance of this line. The branding itself was completely superfluous, though the essence of the brand and the types of games released under it helped propel gaming to be as big as it is today. So, thank you, Nintendogs.